Hi guys, I'm Kat and today I have for you a word in Romanian, actually a greeting in Romanian, a true crime case and makeup as well. So, the greeting in Romanian is Buna ziua. Buna ziua. Buna ziua. Well done guys, you just said good afternoon. So before we get started with today's video, just a quick disclaimer, I don't mean any disrespect to anyone I talk about in the video, this is for educational purposes only and all the information that I'm giving you is already found in the public domain. Today's case, if you believe it or you don't, takes us to the year 1885. And I think that actually this is my very first video covering a true crime case from the Victorian era. And I'm sure that Carla is very happy I'm doing it, right Carla? You are happy. It's from your era, yeah? <laughs> Few crimes have the power to shock in the way that a parent causing harm to their child does and it's as true now as it must have been in 1885 when Swansea was horrified by the case of a father accused of murdering his young daughter by throwing her off the town's pier into the stormy sea. What drove this father to commit the most despicable act a human being can I am not entirely sure but maybe we can find out. So, let's get into it. Thomas Nash was born in 1847 and grew up in Castle Martin, Pembrokeshire, Wales, in the United Kingdom. Before he moved to Swansea as a young man. There's not much known about his life as a young man considering that, you know, this case happened in the 1880s. So records are not exactly accurate and as details as we might have them these days. He grew up in a booming industrial town and we also know about his life that he was married and he worked in a variety of jobs including as a furnace man at Spelter Works. He and his wife Martha, they had two daughters, Sarah aged 17 and Martha Ann aged six. It seems that his wife actually died in the year after the birth of their youngest daughter Martha Ann. When Sarah was a teenager and Martha Ann was still a toddler, the family moved into a lodging house in Graham Street in Hayford. By this point Thomas was working as a laborer on the roads for Swansea Corporation, the forerunner of the local council. Thomas conducted himself in a most respectable and steady manner and he was by all accounts a good father and there was absolutely no indication of what was to come. In early November 1885, Thomas suddenly moved out of the lodging house, taking his possessions with him but he left his children behind. Sarah, who was aged 17 at the time, and Martha Ann, almost six years old at the time. Over the next few weeks, the landlady of the house, Eliza Goodwin, saw Thomas around town a couple of times and she told him that she couldn't carry on looking after his daughters. It seems that Thomas, he actually promised to go back to the house and collect the children and to settle the outstanding bill for their lodging. But it turns out that Thomas never actually did that. No one knew at the time, but Thomas Nash remarried on November 16, 1885. That's when he suddenly moved out of the lodging house, leaving both of his children behind. He kept the ceremony secret from friends and even from his own daughters. But this wasn't the only secret that 39-year-old Thomas kept. His new wife, check this out, his new wife had absolutely no idea whatsoever that Thomas had children. He never told her about his daughters Sarah and Martha Ann. The landlady of the house where his daughters were staying grew desperate. So late on the afternoon of Friday, December the 4th, she took Martha Ann to Swansea Town Hall where she knew that Thomas was due to be paid. She confronted him and then she handed Martha Ann over to him. 
she also gave him a bill for the rent and for looking after his children. The total bill was one pound sixteen shillings and two pence. I am hoping that uh, this is right, but I will also put it on your screen. This would be the equivalent of around 120 pounds in today's money. It would have been roughly around one week's wage for a skilled tradesman. Thomas, he promised that he will settle the bill the next day. Martha Ann didn't really want to stay with her dad. She wanted to go back to her Graham Street home with Eliza, but the landlady told her, no child, your father will attend to you now. After the encounter and Martha Ann being left with Thomas, they were both seen by colleagues leaving the town hall with his daughter. At about 5.15 on that evening, a few pilots and boatmen who were standing outside the watch house on Swansea Pier saw a man walking hand in hand with a little girl onto the pier. It was a windy evening with waves breaking over the pier and it was already quite dark outside. Because of the weather, the proximity to the water, the wind and the time of the day, the man in the watch house found it very very strange that someone would take a child onto the pier in those conditions. The man and the small child were seen disappearing into the darkness were Thomas and his six-year-old daughter Martha Ann. After a very short time, the same man, they actually saw Thomas leaving the pier, but Martha Ann was nowhere to be seen. Thomas jumped from the pier onto the sand and he ran off towards the bathing machines on the beach. Now, if you guys don't know what a bathing machine is, because I certainly didn't know myself, let me tell you. The bathing machine was actually a small hut on wheels with entrances on either side. A swimmer would enter the bathing machine while it was parked on the beach and change into their bathing suit. Then the bathing machine would be dragged out into deeper water either by horse or by human power. Once the machine had gone far enough into the water, the swimmer would emerge from the opposite door and dive into the ocean far away from the prying eyes of those on the beach. When they finished swimming, they could re-enter the bathing machine and raise a little flag to signal that they were ready to return to the beach. So really, this was for modesty purposes. I don't think I can actually compare it with anything that we have nowadays, but I think that maybe the closest uh, would be a changing room perhaps, where you try clothing on in a shop. I mean, when these bathing machines were launched in the 1750s, they did serve a bit of a purpose. Bathing suits hadn't yet been invented and almost everyone swam naked. But even after rather modest bathing get-ups became the norm, the bathing machine stuck around thanks to the famously conservative Victorians. In their heyday in the 19th century, bathing machines crowded beaches in Europe, the US and Mexico. Around the turn of the 20th century, bathing machines began to disappear as the ideas around modesty became more relaxed. A few of them survived as beachside cabins and huts, but for the most part, the bathing machine became a footnote in history, a testament to the bizarre lengths that people will go to to protect themselves from the dangerous temptations of the female body. Going back now to Thomas and our case, you remember that I mentioned the man in the watch house? Well, their suspicions aroused after seeing Thomas running towards the bathing machines and the boatman actually chased after him and they managed to catch him. They ended up questioning Thomas about Martha Ann because they wanted to know where she was and he told them that she was on the pier but then he changed his story and he claimed that she was under the pier. He then tried to walk into the sea and he had to be restrained. The pilots detained Thomas and then they took him to the dock policeman, Police Constable Davis. Newspaper reported that news of what happened was already spreading across the town and crowds were actually beginning to gather around the docks and the pier. The Cardiff Times reported that 
thinking there must have been some intention on the part of Nash to outrage the child, many expressed the greatest indignation and it was with some difficulty they were restrained from roughly using him. Thomas was later taken back to the pier and this is where he told them his version of events. He put Martha Ann on the railings so she can climb on his back but Martha Ann slipped and the wind blew her over the side into the sea. I am not sure that I buy this story. I mean, it doesn't quite make sense, honestly. Martha Ann was six years old. She wasn't a baby. So she couldn't have possibly not keep herself balanced enough or, you know, holding on to her dad so she doesn't fall over the railings. And she wasn't exactly as a baby or a toddler would be in terms of weight so I'm not sure that I buy this story entirely. Thomas was taken to the police station and charged with Martha Ann's murder. In the meantime police officers they conducted a search of the pier and foreshore by lantern light and after a very short time they found Martha Ann's body laying on a pile of rubbish which was left on the sands by the receding tide. The following Monday, an inquest was held into her death at the Vivian's Arms Hotel before County Coroner Edward Streak and the body of Martha Ann was identified by her sister Sarah. There were no signs of physical injury to Martha Ann's body and the cause of death was drowning. After evidence from a number of witnesses, including Police Constable Davis, the jury returned a verdict of willful murder and Thomas Nash was committed for trial. The trial took place in Cardiff Crown Court the following February before Lord Chief Justice Coleridge. Barrister Arthur Lewis set out the prosecution case and the court heard from several witnesses including the men who were on the pier on the night in question. Both men, Thomas Fender and assistant pilots William Owens and George Pritchard, as well as from Swansea Harbour Trust employee James Turpey, who told the jury about the construction of the pier. The court also heard evidence from Eliza Goodwin and the landlady of another lodging house, Hannah Daffy, who said that Thomas and his new wife lived with her from November 17 to December the 4th. The jury also heard evidence from police officers who had been involved in the investigation as well as medical evidence from surgeon David Howell Thomas. In his closing speech, Mr. Glaskadine for the defense reminded the jury that Thomas had been referred to as a kind and indulgent father. He said that no one had actually seen what happened on the pier that night and it was not reasonable to assume that Thomas's parental fondness could have just disappeared in a moment. Referring to his behavior after the incident on the pier and him trying to flee across the sand, the barrister said Thomas's reason could have been unhinged by the awful accident which just, which just happened to his child. The barrister asked the jury to give the benefit of any doubt they may have to Thomas. Well, honestly, guys, I don't agree with that. If Thomas really was so worried about the accident that Martha Ann had, he wouldn't just run away from the scene, you know. He would try to help his own daughter and even ask for help from other people. But he did absolutely nothing. Even when the man at the pier detained him and asked him what had happened, even then he didn't say that he needed help to save his daughter. Instead, what he was trying to do was he was trying to flee. After deliberating for 15 minutes, the jury returned a verdict of guilty. The judge placed a black silk square on top of his wig and the clerk of the court asked Thomas if there was any reason why the death penalty should not be imposed. Thomas replied quietly but firmly, I am not guilty, sir. Okay, so the black cat, probably you haven't heard of this before, of course, that uh, I had to Google this one as well. I hate when I don't know things and when I have questions, 
so i'm always trying to make sure that uh, you know i get the answers to the questions that i have it seems that the black cap was worn by a judge when passing a sentence of death in british and irish law even though this is named a cap the black cap is not exactly a fitted cap but rather a plain square of black cloth which was based on Tudor court headgear. When the black cap is worn, it's placed on top of the judicial wig with one corner of the black cap facing forward. Even though the abolition of the death penalty in the United Kingdom was in 1965, the black cap still remains part of a judge's official regalia and as such is still carried into the high court of justice by each sitting judge when in full ceremonial dress it's worn every year on the 9th of november when the new lord mayor of the city of london is presented to the law court it's also part of the regalia of a judge of the high court of northern ireland the black cap was also used in the republic of ireland where the legal system was modeled on the english uh, courts until the death penalty was officially abolished in 1990 even though no death sentences had been passed since 1954. The black cap was worn by judges in Northern Ireland passing death sentences until the death penalty was officially abolished by Northern Ireland in 1973. After Thomas's conviction, the Weekly Mail reported that outside the courtroom, Sarah, the devastated daughter of Thomas, was taken away crying in agony. Following his conviction, Thomas was taken by train to Swansea to await his execution. After his conviction, the Home Secretary was petitioned to intervene in the case with campaigners arguing there was not the slightest evidence that he, at any time or in any way, contemplated the destruction of this little child or that any sufficient motive has been suggested for the crime of murder. They argued that Thomas's version of events was at least possible and the evidence against him was circumstantial. And they begged the Home Secretary to advise the Queen to use her prerogative of mercy and commute the death sentence. The Home Secretary said that he wouldn't intervene and would allow the law to take its course. The papers reported that in the weeks before his death, Thomas's appetite was exceedingly good while being held in jail, eating his daily breakfast of a large mutton chop, potatoes, bread and butter, and a pint of tea. He also wrote a few letters, including to the prison chaplain and doctor, although he received just one visitor, his teenage daughter, Sarah to whom he maintained his innocence. But in a letter to the governor of the prison, Thomas, he finally confessed the truth, that he did kill Martha Ann. This is what his confession said. Quote, I had planned out what to do. I took her down to the beach first uh, and through the tide being so rough, I could not get near enough to the deep water to throw her in, but the pier head came into my head and down I went with her. And out about the fourth of sixth or sixth seat, I made three attempts. And the third time, the old devil said, throw her in and it will be all right. And I did it. Then I went back a little way and jumped down over the rail and attempted to make my escape. But it was not to be. The reason for doing this crime was I had not told my wife I had children. And if anybody asked where Martha Ann was, I was going to tell them she was sent to Carmarthen for a bit for a change of air, end of quote. Monday, March the 6th, 1886 was the day of Thomas's hanging. It was a really cold day and Swansea was covered in fresh snow. People began to gather outside the town jail more than one hour before the allotted execution time and by 8 a.m., 
The crowd was estimated as numbering up to 4,000 people. The South Wales Echo reported that for the most part the crowd was orderly, though some roughs indulged in throwing snowballs. A few minutes after 8 o'clock, a black flag was raised above the prison to signify the execution had been carried out and it was reported that the crowd dispersed quickly and people went about their usual business. He later came to light that Thomas Nash remarried just weeks before the death of his youngest daughter, Martha Ann, but he didn't tell his wife about his children. Martha Ann Nash was buried in December 1885, 86, in Langifelag Cemetery. It's not known what happened to her sister Sarah after Thomas was executed, but I suppose that because she was 17 at the time, she would have been, you know, quite independent and she was able to probably work. So I really do hope that she had an easy life. I can't imagine how Sarah felt having lost her younger sister and her father in the space of just a few months after losing her own mother earlier. It must have been terrifying for her and she must have gone through a lot of trauma. Especially considering she believed that her father was innocent. She believed him when he said that he didn't harm Martha Ann. But then he wrote the confession letter. Which completely shattered, I suppose, Sarah's world. It's unimaginable and unforgivable a father to kill their own child for a woman. Why? Why would you do that? Your children should always come first. What did Thomas expect? What did he expect? He wanted to stop being a father after remarrying? Did he find Martha Ann an inconvenience and perhaps an extra expense? Martha Ann was only six years old. He would have had to take care of her. He would have had to tell his new wife about her. I don't get why he didn't tell her from the beginning. Maybe he believed that if he got rid of his youngest child, his secret would be safe. Maybe he was thinking Sarah was 17, soon to marry off and, you know, his new wife would be none the wiser. I mean, this is just a disgusting behavior and a disgusting way of thinking, honestly. And uh, I know that uh, in the 1880s, things were going differently and perhaps it was uh, maybe you didn't have as many chances to remarry if you had the children from your first marriage. However, like I said, the case remains as it was then in the 1880s as it is right now in 2022 that your children should always come first. And there is absolutely no excuse in this world for someone to kill their own child. Please guys do let me know if you've heard of this case before please let me know what do you think and please let me know if you think that thomas made a good decision not to tell his wife before getting married to her that he actually had children of his own again let me know in the comment section down below and also if you are interested in any of the makeup that i'm wearing in today's video all the products and the links will be in the description uh, down below under this video thank you so much take care stay safe and i will see you in the next one Bye.